Eh, Arracha al León, eh, hola, buenas tardes, es curioso esto de hablar así a la cámara, parece una que está sola en su casa, pero bueno, eso que muchas, eh, muchas gracias a toda la gente que, que estáis acudiendo a esta conferencia, eh, os agradecemos a todas las personas que, que habéis atendido a la llamada, que habéis compartido la información, que habéis estado compartiéndola desde México, desde Argentina, Colombia, París desde Berlín. Eh, bueno, muchísimas eh, gracias por la difusión y por, por acudir hoy a esta habitación propia de Consoni. Y desde Consoni también queremos agradecer a la Feria de, de Libros y de Ideas eh, Radicales, literal, que haya organizado Radical Mail, eh, este programa de charlas online. Como sabéis, estamos, vamos a participar en este programa de charlas con Charlene Carruters, que hablará mañana, y hoy tenemos a Donna Haraway, que entrará aquí. Eh, está en su propia habitación, compartiendo habitación con nosotras, a punto de esperar con Helen Torres. Eh, la charla va a ser íntegramente en inglés y más adelante sí que editaremos un vídeo con subtítulos para que podamos difundir las ideas de Donna Haraway que consideramos que son fundamentales para comprender eh, el, el, la situación tan extraña, estos tiempos tan raros que nos están tocando vivir. Eh, pues poco más eh, tengo que añadir, Milla eh, Esquer. Eh, por otro lado, sí que quería decirles que... Uh, in this uh, ecological devastation, multispecies feminist theorist Donna Haraway offers provocative new ways to reconfigure our relations to the earth and all its inhabitants. She will talk today, now, with the translator of her latest book, Seguir con el Problema, that we published uh, last year, the sociologist and educator and also translator and friend Helen Torres. Uh, they are uh, with us, they are going to talk in a minute. And And the, the, the last thing I want to tell you is that uh, if you want to make any, any question, if you want to say, if, if the public do that you are, you are listening to us, um, if you want to make any question, you can use the hashtag Haraway Consoni, uh, altogether Haraway Consoni on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And we will select some, the, some of the questions to ask to her just in the end of the conversation. Uh, and also, uh, uh, we want to also thank you, obviously, to Donna and to Helen, that they want to join us uh, to this conversation. And please, I want to say to everyone that we let's not stop buying books from our favorite publishers and bookstores. No dejemos de comprar libros en nuestras editoriales y librerías preferidas. Y si no tenéis este libro, seguir con el problema, os animamos a que lo adquiráis en todostuslibros.com o en libelista.com para apoyar a las librerías o bien en nuestra propia web. I don't really have anything else to say, just I remember the hashtag, Haraway con Sony, just to, to make any question. We will select the questions and in the end, Helen gonna, is going to make one of these questions to Donna. So... That's it. Thank you, Donna and, and Helen, and it's your turn. Thank you very much. Okay, so here. Okay. <laughs> hello, hello, everybody. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you, Maria, for your presentation. And thank you, Donna, for sharing, for your generosity, for sharing your, your time with us. You know, and thank you for your work. You know, that it was And so inspiring and generative, you know, in, in ways in my life and in ways that I, I, I can't have imagined the first time I read you, you know. And so thank you for all this. And I would like to offer like uh, this conversation, uh, not, not as a list of solutions of what to do or much less what to believe, but, you know, as a device, as a device to, to learn how to think better, to learn how to think well, you know, in, in these times of uncertainty. Okay, so. 
I had, I was yesterday trying to put <clears throat> all my questions together and there were so many questions and I have, I, I also have written to colleagues and, and, and people I know from the fields of art and, and activism to share also their questions to Donna. And of course I have so many things to say, but I realized that uh, all of the questions we, people were asking uh, have a, a connection between them and it is how we read your book today. Okay, so this is such a big question that what I'm going to do is to, you know, introduce the question and the situation in, in what is going on today and with a quotation from the book, okay? Mm -hmm. And here I bought the book, okay, in Spanish. The book was, I, I hear, okay, <laughs> <laughs> which is beautiful. So this is the Spanish person, version, uh, which was published last year, but the original version, which I also have here, because it's the one I'm going to read the quotation from, it was published uh, like in 2016. So exactly. <laughs> so 2016, that you wrote the book like at least five years ago. So the, the problem was, of course, the problem that led us to the situation we are now, that it has mutated a lot. Okay, this problem, but especially where I think that it has changed a lot, is how we read the problem. Okay, so let me start with my first question. Because I just wanted to, uh, before starting with the question, I want to read a quotation from your book for people who have, ha haven't read it. And it's like it talks to spectacular thinking. Uh, I want to read this to for people to uh, have an idea of uh, what you said like more than five years ago and how we read it today, okay? And the quotation says, how can we think in time of urgency without the self indulgent and self fulfilling needs of apocalypse? When every fiber of our being is interlaced, even complicit, in the webs of processes that must somehow be engaged and repatterned. Okay, so now I read this and I feel really touched. It's like very intense. So my first question has to do with something that you said in the introduction of the book. And is that you said that the book uh, and the idea of staying with the trouble are especially impatient with two responses that I hear all too thickly to the horrors of the Anthropocene and the capital of sin. The first is easy to describe and I think dismiss, namely a comic faith in terms of fiction, whether secular or religious. The second response, harder to dismiss, is probably even more destructive, destructive namely a position that the game is over. And so these two kind of responses, like the technophic solution and the game over, are everywhere today. Like we have, you know, like the idea of the vaccine, the vaccine is going to be the solution to all our problems. And of course, it's very difficult to dismiss the idea of the game over. Okay. And so the question is, how do you how do we become with the virus? Okay, how how do we because I I heard also um Vincent Depre. Uh, these days, this encounter such uh, KM that she said that we have to uh, be diplomatic. You know, we have to be diplomatic with, with the virus. And all the idea of the book is 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 probably this idea of becoming with. Like it's not technofix, it's not the game over. It's becoming with. You say we become with, or we don't become at all. So this is my first question: How we do become with the virus? And what do you think about? this statement of, of Lucian that we have to be diplomatic with the virus. Okay. Uh, buenos días y buenas tardes. Y, uh, <laughs> quiero decir muchas gracias para la traducción, Elena, y para la publicación, María. Necesitamos nuestras uh, librerías. Uh, hoy uh, es muy importante. And then I will switch to English. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, it is not game over, and we have no techno fix, but we are living in uh, times of um, urgency. Uh, did the the, the um, picture? Okay, my picture failed for a second. Uh, I, there are there are so many things to say. 
uh, that so many things to feel and do with each other in the t in pandemic time, in times of um, uh, intensified. Um, in we have an intensified living and intensified consciousness of what has been released in Gaia, what has been released in the um, the ways in which the Earth has been damaged, so that it has become pandemic friendly so that the uh, rapid spread of mass disease and the intensification of extraction, even in times of mass suffering, such that catastrophe capitalism is doing very well today, thank you. In fact, there are super profits being made, um, even as uh, the uh, disease and death is experienced, for example, in the United States with special severity uh, in communities of color, uh, in uh, indigenous lands, for example, the Navajo Nation has the highest rate of illness and death uh, in the United States. It's a higher rate of illness and death even than New York City, which is horrific. And within New York City, we, also, we all know that the burden is especially borne um, in the communities of color of, of New York City, not only, but with special intensity. So that um, the uh, times in which we are living are times of intensification of what, what has been the case structurally, affectively uh, in the world for a long time. Um, and this is a time also when we see people um, trying to think and act, trying to, to uh, realize what will come after that is not the same as what come, came before trying to, to um, think through and enact the kinds of communities, the kinds of um, movements toward care and justice, uh, the kinds of, re for example, rethinking the, uh, the question of food supply uh, as a question of care and justice that is intensified in pandemic times. Um, it is perfectly clear that essential workers in the food supply in country after country after country are people who are hyper exploited, often migrant, often illegal, often not owning the land, often not having the proper kind of housing and protection of their own health, often with the worst schools, often not speaking the languages of the dominant culture, that the food supply chains Rest, uh, um, rest on both the organisms, the monocropped plants and the monocropped animals, rest on the non-human and the human um, in ways that perpetuate food injustice, food deserts in some places, hyper elite um, food, uh, you know, food castles you know, in other places. Lots of us in time of pandemic um, are, um, uh, are, are seriously thinking, rethinking how the crisis in food could result in stronger local markets, different kinds of supply chains, attention to legalization and protection of the workers in food, uh, paying attention to the way essential workers um, are in many ways the most exploited. So it seems to me that in times of pandemic, without apocalypse, and without the idea of techno fix, it's not that the vaccine is going to fix all of this, but our heightened realization um, around question of who eats and how and who is eaten and how could perhaps result in some major changes, um, major challenges, both to the conditions of labor and to the sheer existence of the of industrial animal agriculture and of globalized food chains. Uh, that result in uh, extremely uneven food insecurity. I think of that as a way of negotiating with the virus, uh, that the, the virus heightens this, um, but the virus doesn't cause this situation. And in the time of, of relative shutdown, in the time of economic crisis, shut down for some and forced labor for others, um, this is not a time of sheltering for everybody. In fact, it has been a time of intensified exposure for many, while vast numbers of people are shut down and economies are destroyed. In this intensified situation of urgency, perhaps major kinds of ways of living and dying, for example, uh, the animal industrial food complex, will finally be subject to the kind of political emotional, 
um, uh, community uh, movements toward justice and care that have been needed for a long time, but are especially clear now. Does that, does that make some sense? Yeah, thank you for, for the answer, because you answered lots of other questions I had. <laughs> I was going to ask you, that's perfect. But uh, now, when you were talking, I thought about two things you said, uh, which were very important in your book. One is the idea of double death, uh -huh. and then the idea of temporality. Okay, so let's go first, uh, in connecting with what, what you have just said, uh, this idea of double death from Deborah Burr Rose, uh, which you, you, you really use in your book in a very interesting and important way. So I'm going to read um, a note, the note, of the book are amazing <laughs> and this is a note to chapter five which is sowing worlds one of my favorite chapters in the book is where you have this string figure with, with Ursula Kalle Wynn okay and here you have this um, this quote from Deborah Bear Rose from a report from a white country and you said Rose taught me that recuperation not reconciliation or restoration is what is needed to make I find many of the words that begin with re useful, including resurgence and resilience. Post is more of, is more of a problem. So I, I would you like to expand on this idea of double death and, and yeah. how we do this. Deborah Bird Rose, is, uh, who died recently and is a major loss from our community, uh, was an, Aust uh, an anthropologist who worked in Australia. And from her teachers, her Aboriginal teachers in northern uh, and north central Australia, uh, she in English proposed the idea of double death um, the, uh, that she felt she had learned from um, study with, with her teachers, her mentors. Um, the double death is not, is about the killing of ongoingness, living and dying in, um, in flourishing in mortal and finite ways taking care of country, taking care of land, taking care of generations in living and dying together is good. Double death is not living and dying. It's not about dying or even killing. It's about the killing of ongoingness, the killing of the conditions of going on, the killing of the heart, the killing of the land, the obliteration of species, the obliteration of ways of living and dying together. Double death is the killing of ongoingness, the killing of the possibility of carrying on. Uh, so mass extinction, ma uh, genocide, uh, ecological destruction, those are all examples of double death. Um, the, the, I think that what, uh, what all of us face now is, come, is, um, living to un is learning to undo the threads of double death and to re, re um, reconstitute, to rehabilitate, to make live again through partial healing um, the ways of living and dying that deserve a present and deserve a future. Uh, so there will be no going back to prior conditions. There will be no complete recuperation, some complete restoration, or even reconciliation after, not, not just after, but in the midst of ongoing genocide. But we need to reconstitute our conditions of going on with each other, with, a, with an acute consciousness of, the, of what we have inherited, of the historical strengths and devastations, both, that we have inherited. Um, and I think of Deborah Bird Rose as one of the people who has taught me the most from her own work. Um, I think of Leslie Green in South Africa. I think of Kim, Tal Kim Talbear in Edmonton, so on and so forth. I think of all of these people who are deeply engaged um, with, um, with real places, with both indigenous and other kinds of people who live in place for the possibility of flourishing. You said, uh, there's something you said in the book that I really love, is, and it's like, uh, nobody lives alone, you know, everybody is connected to something, but uh, not anything is connected to everything. And that no. every, everybody lives in one place, not everywhere. Uh, no, exactly. Nobody is every place and nobody is responsible for doing everything, but we are responsible for doing what we can. 
and we are responsible for from being in place uh building out the loops building out with others the loops and connections uh and uh you know hyper hyperspace is this wonderful cr little crocheted fabulous critter uh that was made by uh, vanda mcintyre science fiction writer and crocheter who contributed to the crochet coral reef uh which is a marvelous figuration and instantiation of being in place with others and looping out, making connections, making the kinds of connections that are our cosmopolitanism. So it's not a cosmopolitanism from above, but it's a kind of cosmopolitanism from being in place and making place with each other uh, and connecting place, connecting. So it's not a question of being restricted to the local, kind of being hedged in by walls, but it's a, it's a question of, of looping and throwing out and catching the loops thrown out by others. So it was to tie together what needs to be tied together in order to live well um, as, earthly, as earthly beings. Mm -hmm. Well, well, well this, this is like, like uh, uh, I think that these things is very difficult, very difficult like no? these connections, uh, being isolated with this lockdown, you know, it's like, I found it like I know that virtual virtuality cannot replace the whole corporality, and but it, it doesn't also it doesn't mean that it, it disappears. But we have I think we have to learn how to connect differently. Okay, and I think that one of the the, the the ways we can do is what you do with stories, with your storytelling, because all the book and all the, the storytelling you practice is connecting ideas. I mean, your idea, sorry, you're connecting the stories, the different stories. They're not isolated stories, but uh, you look for, uh, you highlight the connection between the stories. For example, uh, your, your, the last chapter in the book, which is uh, Camille's stories, you know, which is, uh, you finish this book, which is kind of, we could say it's an academic book. It, it, it has the, you know, the, 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 the format of an academic book, but it ends, you end the book with a, with a, with a story, with a speculative fabulation story, which is really risky, and, and I, I, I adore that, okay? So, uh, you want to talk, uh, you want to tell the, something about this story, the Camille stories, uh, if you want to, I can read a little bit for people who haven't read it. Okay, Camille stories, okay, this is chapter eight. And Donna says, the children are called Compost because Camille is a part of this community of the Compost. And say the children of Compost is, insist that we need to write stories and live lives for flourishing and for abundance, especially in the teeth of rampaging destruction and impoverization. Okay, so what can you tell us about this? Camille stories and how can these Camille stories help us to think with or to think better? So um, let's see if I can get this here. Yeah, mm -hmm. perfect. Yeah. <laughs> this is the front piece for the Camille stories. This is a wood sculpture made in the early 20th century in Mexico. Uh, it is in a museum uh, in Vancouver. Uh, it's not clear who made it or exactly how this wood sculpture came to the museum in Vancouver. But for me, it is um, a uh, really powerful um, way of thinking about the, the ties of the earth, the ties of human beings with each other, the ties of the human and the more than human, the human and the non-human uh, in times of great precarity and vulnerability. So that the Camille stories are my first effort at writing a speculative fiction, a science fiction. And it grew out of a narration speculative workshop in France. And I was in a little uh, afternoon session with Vincent Despray and Fabrizio Terranova. And the organizers of the workshop had set up our little narration speculative exercise by giving every little writing group a baby. Uh, and saying, you now have a baby in your hands and you are responsible to this baby. And somehow you have to get this baby through five generations, five human generations. This baby and this baby's the generations somehow have to persist for five generations. So do something in your story. 
So Vincent and uh, and Fabrizio and I decided that our baby uh, was neither male nor female, but had the name Camille, which is uh, gender fluid, and that we developed a world, a science fiction world, a speculative, fabulative world, uh, in which communities came together across the earth or were resurgent already in place on the earth for a heightened kind of care uh, through these periods of great, great danger, in particular in relation to the disappearance of ways of life, the disappearance of peoples, the disappearance of other critters. In the community of Camille, it set up in a coal mining area in West Virginia that had been devastated by mountaintop coal removal. Um, and sets, this community comes together uh, and one of the purposes of the communities of compost is over a period of a few hundred years to bring the numbers of human beings on the earth from the roughly 11 billion they will be at the end of this century, gradually down to some other number that is more in keeping with balancing the human and the non-human on this earth, but to do it with reproductive and environmental justice. The concepts developed particularly by women of color, Sister Song and others, through the, uh, through the practices of environmental and reproductive feminist and anti-racist justice as the means and not just the goal, so that the rebalancing of the earth is done, is done through practices of multi-species um, environmental and reproductive justice. So that in the Camille communities, every new baby has at least three parents. And the person who carries the baby has a particular responsibility, which is to identify an, uh, other, another species that is in danger of disappearing over the five generations, unless the communities take special responsibility. So that the baby born as Camille is bonded to monarch butterflies at birth, including genetically bonded, so that the human beings are genetically altered, not the butterflies. And the job of the human beings is to bond with other people and other critters across the life range of the monarch butterflies, that the monarchs might have a future reaching five generations. So the Camilles inherit this responsibility from each other from generation to generation. And in the second generation, Camille spends a great deal of time in Michoacan and Mexico in the areas where the monarch butterflies that fly across the great eastern flyway that reaches from Mexico uh, up through uh, Central America, uh, you know, up, up through the, uh, the Gulf area and across the eastern United States and into Canada, that great swath of butterflies that migrate north and south through winter and summer in which over winter in Mexico, Camille is part of the cosmopolitanism of the Camilles, which is to make connections uh, uh, with the people, with the farmers, with the foresters, with the campesinos, with the indigenous peoples, with uh, so forth, across the life ways of the butterfly to make flourish the human and the non-human together. So Camille is taken in hand by the Zapatista women in defense of land and water, um, and first learns about uh, trans basin water transfers, whereby the waters of the water rich areas of Michoacan are transported to Mexico City, even while the farms and the peoples of, of, of Michoacan are water poor, uh, their lands are converted, uh, their, um, their subsistence areas are converted into avocados for international export, a money crop that leaves people even more food vulnerable, perhaps a little more money, but in, a, in an international global food chain uh, tied together by green gold or avocados. Uh, Camille, Camille learns, in other words, the whole apparatus of transformation of life ways, which among other things, endanger the monarch butterflies, but not just the monarch butterflies, whole ways of life. Uh, and Camille's alliances then are to work with and for the human and the non-human, the Oyamil fir trees, the peoples of the butterfly reserves, the peoples in the intermediate forest that are important for water and for wood, 
uh, the peoples and the other organisms, with the crops, with the trees, with the avoc to be diplomatic with the avocado trees is a little bit like being diplomatic with the with the corona, the new coronavirus. How to be diplomatic, so that the job of Camille in these communities of compost is to engage in the practices of multi-species justice and care with my doll. Okay, this was given to me on my fiftieth birthday. Uh, by Jim Clifford and Judith Asen. Uh, Judith teaches uh, in um, on Chiapas uh, every year mm -hmm. in uh, Mayan uh, communities and was particularly uh, aware of the Zapatista movements. Uh, and Jim and Judith gave me this doll for my 50th birthday and she has been one of my animating figures uh, ever since. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's one of the ancestors of Camille. <laughs> This doll is one of the reasons that Camille traveled to Michoacan. Uh, uh, right before the Camille story, so it is like long before, long before. But it, but it is a fact uh, that the Zapatista movement today. It was in 2019 that the Zapatista women had an international uh, conference uh, of great power, talking about questions of water and land and justice and community. It's an ongoing, present tense. Uh, movement. Uh, thank you for, for the way well, the, the, this summary you make of the Camille story is incredible. And I think that Camille stories is really a story of making kin, okay, which is the, the subtitle of the book. The subtitle of the book is Making Kin in the Philistine. And I, I think what you finish the book very coherently with this, like all the ideas and all the concepts and the fears you, you've been you know, developing throughout the book. Finally, you put them all in a storytelling that connects all this idea of making kin and what that really means, kin, you know, in population also, but it's also in, in fact, because you, you use a lot of scientific facts to, to build this story also, and all the story you, you tell about the water and so. And, and what I love is the idea of this making kin, not babies, is how it makes responsibility, or how, as you call it, this son's ability, you know, with the benefit of the hyphen, you know, like two words that combine to make something like bigger. And, and this idea of the responsibility and this idea of making key that it has to do also with this diplomacy, you know, and, and it also resonates with me that these days, uh, some people from queer movement or gay, gay activists and people living or dying with AIDS, with AIDS you know, uh, they, they, they highlighted uh, something that uh, we have learned or we should have learned from uh, the, what it was called pink, pink uh, pandemic. You have to remember the name, okay? The AIDS pandemic, and it is the difference between contagious and transmission. And the difference matters because it places responsibility or responsibility not on guilty and not on being guilty, but it places it on care, you know, and it, which is the way that you, we were just telling about how this community of the campus, you know, like got together and, uh, and work with this work with this um, monarch, monarch butterflies, not to save them, you know, but as to make them present, you know, in this ongoing that, that you said. Okay, so um, there's so many things. Okay, I want to go back because I, I we just talked about responsibility. That was what an, another question which I think is very important. I think that was got quite clear, and then there's, there's the thing of temporality, which I think temporality is very important, not only in your book, but as the way, as you have already mentioned, the way that we are living, you know, the, this idea uh, that, uh, of the future that we have, you know, the first, especially the first 15 days after the, you know, the confinement, uh, there was this kind of phenomenon that a lot of people started to upload, you know, uh, pictures of themselves when they were young, you know, and, and then they were like massive, you know, in everywhere in the world. And then there was this friend that say, what's going on? Are we saying goodbye by Facebook or what is this, you know? And then another one said, oh, well, maybe it's, we can't imagine the future. And so we are looking back into our past. And I say, well, yeah, but I mean, this is an individual past, okay? But it looks as if uh, we can't imagine the future because we, 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 we lost uh, or, you know, we lost all, our, all, all our, our, our appointments, you know, and, and, and our plans. And it was like, it looks like if we hadn't, if we hadn't alive, you know. 
And that, when I was thinking that all the time, it popped out in my mind uh, two words that you repeat in your book and that were very inspiring, which is, which is a thick present. You all the time talk about this thick present, and, and you define the Sulu scene also, which is temporality, you know, which is entangled, and is this uh, what has been, what it is, and it's yet to become. You know, I, I'm going to read the quotation for people. The, 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 the question goes for, for you to expand on this idea of the thick present, and how, how do we read this today? Okay, and so this one is, I have the mess of, Okay, okay, so, yes. This one is uh, the Sound World. It's, you say in Sound World, again, I'm reading a quotation again from the same chapter, sorry. <laughs> and you say, with Lewin, I am committed to the finicky, disrupted details of good stories that don't know how to end. Good stories reach into rich paths to sustain thick presence to keep the story going for those who came after. So can you talk about this thick present and what kind of stories are these good stories we need in this thick present? There we go. I think you know that Ursula Le Guin is one of my heroes uh, and that her uh, paper from now many years ago uh, the carrier bag theory of fiction uh, is very important to me. And in that story, she talks about needing to uh, stop telling the prick tale, the tale of the hero with, with the weapons, the, the tale, truly the, the tale of phallic travels and return with the, with the bounty uh, that, that enough with the prick tale. We need to tell the stories um, of with the finicky details of the living and dying together, the tales of collecting and sharing and taking and giving, which are not innocent stories at all, but they're the stories they're the stories of living and dying as a net bag, as a as a as a, a mochia, as a as a kind of collection. Okay. Um, and that these are the stories that Le Guin thinks of as the shape of fiction. So it's not the matrix space with the privileged signifier moving across it, but it's rather something more like this, um, or something more like this. Can you see that? Whoops, wait a minute. Uh, oh, there we go, wait a minute, there we go, okay. <laughs> This is a, uh, a carrier bag that was given to me uh, by uh, Tanya Perez in, in Bogota last summer when I visited. Uh, it's made by a collective of women who are working in defense of land and water and reproductive uh, health and against sexual violence. It's a story of both Campesina and indigenous women uh, who work with fiber crafts. Uh, this one, of course, is, um, uh, you can see this, it's a uterus. Uh, it puns on florecer, uh, florecer and flower bee. I mean, well, the pun is obvious, uh, though it took me a while to get it. This is a carrier bag in Le Guin's carrier bag theory of fiction. And inside this bag, when you receive it, is the histories of the people uh, who are taking action for their lives now in the context of their histories, their human and more than human histories. It is a thick present. It is a present that, that brings up the surging past. The past is present uh, in the present for the ongoing, what is yet to be, what is still possible. It's a story of living thickly with each other in a kind of rich relationship to those who have come before, so as to pass on to those who come after something less violent, which is again from Deborah Bird Rose's way that's what she learned about temporality, that the present is that time of the cultivation of the capacity to respond, responsibility. It's not a list of rules, it's not responsibilities as a preset ethical or political list, but the cultivation with each other of the capacity to respond such that we are accountable to those who came before so as to make what uh, the world, uh, uh, for those who come after, uh, more full of the practices of justice and care. 
Um, and that's what I mean by a thick present. And it's the kind of storytelling that Le Guin practices, but so do many others. Um, I think of um, uh, that our, our storytelling practices are full um, of, of ways of imagining and enacting worlds that make more sense. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, now that you were talking about Ursula Le Guin, I would like to, to read a quotation on your book because you, uh, you use a lot of indigenous thinking, you know, indigenous thinking and practice uh, as a real possibility for regeneration and, and, and resurgence, okay? And you talk a lot of stories, indigenous stories, like the story of Black Mesa in Navajo and Holy Land and the Inupiaq world game, um, Never Alone. You know, and, and you talk, you said something that I love, which is this idea of Navajo, Navajo weaving as a cosmological performance, which is also a way for me of how, how, to, how to keep the story going, how to tell stories, because this idea of weaving is also a storytelling, it's a practice of storytelling. And so I, I want to read this, uh, this quotation, which is in the in chapter which is in Poyasis. And so you said, Navajo weaving fevers, sorry, Navajo, Navajo, no, no, Navajo weaving is practiced all over the Navajo nation, but I will emphasize the weavers of Black Mesa, their chief and their alliances. It would be a serious category mistake to call Navajo weaving, Navajo weaving, or science activism which was a comfortable enough name for the Crochet Coral Reef. Besides, by passing rubbers and precise DNA names, both the categories art and science continue to do colonizing work in this context. However, it would also be a serious category error to fence Navajo women off from ongoing mathematical, cosmological, and creative practice that never fit ongoing colonial definitions. Okay. So, um, I thought it was um, a, a dis the decision to write about um, Dine, Dine Bekeya, Dineta, Navajo Nation, Navajo Weaving, Black Mesa um, was a difficult decision for a lot of reasons. The kind of speaking for indigenous peoples by white people including white women, is uh, enough already. Um, the kind of ease with which a person, uh, 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 Jennifer Denitale has been especially eloquent on this matter, uh, an important uh, a DNA historian and um, you know, active, really important person who is, has been particularly eloquent about the um, importance of, uh, in this case, DNA people speaking for themselves, thank you including in scholarship. Um, and I, in writing that section, I made uh, as much, I worked as hard as I could to read and listen to and be informed by not just uh, white academic, or for that matter, you know, more, not just academic scholarship in the usual ways, especially uh, by white people, but not only, but to try to um, carefully um, listen to and think with Navajo thinkers in an anti, in an anti-colonial way, which is practically, which is essentially impossible. That th this is not an innocent practice. Okay, I'm a person who owns Navajo rugs. I, uh, my husband's father bought a Navajo rug on the reservation many many years ago. So forth, so on. Uh, the the lineage of uh, uh, conquest colonial capitalism in the Southwest is the lineage of, I'm from Colorado, it's my own personal lineage uh, in a range of ways. So uh, the, the thinking with the Navajo weaving on Black Mesa in relationship to the draining of the uh, aquifer to produce water, to transport the coal slurry from Black Mesa to the generating plant um, at the, uh, that produces the power to move water over, to do trans, uh, trans basin water transfer 
to uh, water the cities, uh, Phoenix, uh, to water the cities of the Southwest. The extraction of coal and water uh, from both Hopi and Navajo land, uh, uh, where people, the peoples themselves see their, their water table sinking, their sheep dying, their people displaced, uh, their mark, the prices for their weaving from the 19th century, on being essentially prices that kept people in permanent debt. Uh, I know, for example, that Navajo rugs that are sold today for many, in, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars on the international art market, some of the really old work, was itself sold by the pound as if it were raw wool in the trading posts on the Navajo Nation um, as people are buying sugar and flour and kept in a kind of permanent debt um, so I know something about the structure of colonial conquest and extraction and the structure of the struggle for ind indigenous sovereignty that is built into every one of those rugs. And I know a little bit about the way the patterns of those rugs, which by the way, cannot be protected by, they don't have copyright protection in the way some other uh, indigenous um, products do have copyright protection. They don't have copyright protection because they were already on the international uh, commodity market by the late 19th century as tourist and commodity goods. So that um, the efforts to protect uh, the patterns, uh, the, the way that, that white uh, uh, traders, scholars, uh, activists, so on, can move into and extract ideas, patterns, stories. Um, there's a tremendous controversy right now about a, um, a, a series of books, uh, science fiction books, that make use of some of the, some of the uh, Navajo stories that are not in, uh, that should not be in the public domain, but are in the public domain because they were published. Um, I, am, I am aware that even writing this section of the chapter located me in the midst of multiple contradictions and that there was no way to do that and be innocent. But I thought that the practice of, of solidarity was imp important enough to take the risk of foregrounding uh, what it would mean um, to, uh, to, to cultivate the capacity to respond in this situation. And that these practices of weaving, which um, you know, would be a mistake to, as I said in the quote, uh, relegate to the category of craft fiber art. Uh, on the other hand, these are practices where families um, uh, take great pride in their, in their weaving, in their patterns, where individual women are known as weavers uh, in the Navajo Nation, some men, mostly women, uh, where the sheep, the, uh, the weaving, all of it is um, a matter of great importance and where the selling of these rugs is really important for the income into the Navajo, into the Navajo Nation. So what, can, what constitutes fair price? What constitutes a, a kind of um, relationship to these weavings and the people who weave that is counter to colonial capitalism as, to as opposed to yet one more chapter of it? And I'm not sure if my chapter is one more chapter of colonial extractive capitalism or if it is a partial, um, a gesture of, of, of partial uh, reconciliation. It seems to me that that's the risk of, of that chapter. Uh, well, I, I read the chapter because I'm very worried about this thing because, you know, I'm Argentinian and I live in Europe, but I'm a white person. And so I, I'm a anti-racist and I'm part of this movement of anti-racist people, but always a bit in the, in the background, you know, because uh, some people say, well, but, but you're not white. Yeah, I am white, and, and not, not also that, but my ancestors were colonizers. And not only that, but I'm living in Europe. So I, I love the way that you, 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 you write these stories here, because what I think you're doing is just thinking with, you know, because it, it's very clear that you're very worried on how, for example, the way you not translate the word also, or I don't know how to pronounce it, the word that, this idea of the not the, the, the like a balance in the world, you know, and uh, also this idea that like harmony, that it has been bad translated, you say, or harmony or order. 
you know, this idea of I cannot translate something and, and that you resist to translate it, I think that is like also a gesture to say, okay, I, I, I'm thinking this because we need it. I mean, I, I think that they don't need white people, of course, <laughs> but uh, the earth need this knowledge and this practice and this thinking. And we, we, we people like you or people like me that we have access to, to you know, to, to talk to a lot of other people, people, thinkers, artists, and a, a lot of uh, transformative forces also. We, we need this, this conversation. We need to engage in this conversation. And it's, uh, for me, it's similar to what you do with the making not babies. You know, it's very risky what you said, because, you know, a lot of, uh, not only women, uh, like, uh, and also anti people from the anti-racist movement, it's like, hey, what is this white lady saying, you know? like. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I'm very sorry because I could be like here for hours, but uh, I they're they're just saying us that they, they want. There are a lot of questions from people. They say that more than 500 people connected, and they all say that you're awesome. <laughs> and then I have okay, I I go, I go for the first one. Okay, I'm going to read it as as I can. It says Carlos Hoffman. That idea. Okay, does the idea of staying with the travel refer to the unending struggle of biological life as a meaningful lesson for contemporary humanity? Um, biological life is, is um, relentlessly opportunistic. Uh, it's not so much a struggle as a kind of relentless opportunism full of uh, all sorts of things, including joy and suffering and killing and eating and nurturing and furthering. And the biological world uh, of which we are full members, <laughs> it's not like humanity learns from the biological world, but that uh, humanity is uh, is within the, at what Bruno would call the terrestrial, Bruno Latour, we, t we spoke last weekend, that we are earthly. Uh, and I, uh, I'm a biologist by training and I, I keep up with uh, biological work, particularly in relationship to uh, theories of the holobiont, theories of, of living and becoming with each other from the get-go, that the biological world is and always has been a kind of becoming with uh, and that we have never been one, uh, we have never been individuals. So yes, I think I use, surely I use biology as, um, as metaphor and as story for emphasizing uh, being with, becoming with, um, rather than becoming, becoming with, uh, that we are always already with others uh, in our specificity and our situatedness, that we are not all the same. Human beings are not the same as octopuses. We are not the same uh, as baboons. We are not the same as ants or as coronavirus, but we are with each other on this earth in ways that matter to ongoingness. So I'm really interested in situated specificity. And I think biology is a really good place to learn situated specificity, because if you're gonna take biology seriously, you have to understand what these molecules are doing with these molecules in this kind of, of, um, of world of, of action and association. It's not all the time everywhere. Specificity uh, really matters if you're a serious biologist. Um, and I think that my sense of, of um, staying with the trouble uh, the, I, when I said staying with the trouble, I was more thinking about the troubles, you know, the urgent mm -hmm. crises among us. And I don't think of the biological world inherently as an urgent crisis. On the other hand, the, dis the radical destruction of complex life ways, um, the radical simplification of, of whole ecosystems, uh, the wiping out of all kinds of diversity, human and more than human, um, in systems of, of um, uh, well, monocropping of all kinds, in systems of, of simplification for extraction. Um, that is uh, a trouble within the biological world, uh, including humanity's place in the biological world. But I really don't think of the biological and trouble uh, in, um, it, well, you see what I mean. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, I got to the second question here by YouTube, Chiara Garbelotto. 
Could you say something about the difference between justice and care? Yeah, you've heard me constantly say justice and care that I wasn't happy with just using one of the two words because they carry different resonances. And there's a way in which talking about care, which I think includes uh, true caring, includes justice, which is the sense of, of um, a, a, you know, sharp attention to inequity, uh, to balancing, um, to, to balancing living well, um, to addressing crimes, really crimes against the world, crimes against the earth, crimes against humanity, crimes against in the indigenous, against laboring peoples, against women, uh, the questions of domestic violence and the murder of women, the way, that, for example, that domestic violence has been enhanced by shelter in place. Um, crimes against women and children have been increased, both psychological and physical, in shelter in place. Um, because be, to be confi confined in the domestic space is to be confined within um, inherited structures of violence. Um, the notion of justice is really crucial to thinking well about these dilemmas. I think that um, I need the, the notion of justice in terms of reaching into and addressing structures of injustice and violence. Uh, I need care as that way of nurturing and, and uh, helping to flourish and building the conditions of ongoing with joy, that living and dying with, with joy with each other. It's not that these, these ideas, I think, need each other. And they foreground, in a way, each contains the other, in that real justice contains care and real care contains justice. But they foreground different aspects of what needs to be done. Thank you, Ben. Okay, yeah, mute. No, okay. Third question here by YouTube Jack Brickfield Brick, or something. <laughs> Are there any projects in store for the cameo stories, either by you or other creatures? Are there any other examples of cameo stories you can think of? Well, it turns out that the cameo stories have been picked up by quite a number of people. Uh, in theater, in, in artworks, in storytelling, in a, a kind of online uh, fictional high school exchange about the Camille stories. Uh, the Camille stories have been picked up uh, in ways that, that I really like. Uh, I don't know if I will write any more Camille stories. In a way, I think of that last chapter more like a storyboard. It's more like an outline of possible stories than the actual storytelling. Uh, I turn out, I'm, I'm not very good at writing fiction myself, though I can write a storyboard. Uh, we'll uh, see. Uh, <laughs> you, said, you said in the book that there's, uh, you were going to rest and you were going to build a web page. We did say that, and then we didn't. Uh, we might. It might still happen, uh, but we haven't done it, and it's been five years, so it doesn't look good. That's not okay. <laughs> yeah. That's not because you just open. Uh, what I love of Camille's stories is like it's a very open story. Okay, it, it calls for collaboration of other people. I myself conducted some workshops on, on Camille's stories, and what we did is just it, we took some 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 little pieces of the story and we developed, you know, and, and it was really funny because the the what we got were not other stories. We, we couldn't even write the stories that we imagined, but. Well, the whole idea of the workshop and talking about it and, and, and building like it, it was very performative, more, more than writing, really. Yeah, okay, it's so, I, I think that the, yeah. No, no, it's all, it's all. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> narration speculative, that kind of relaying of stories, the kind of cat's cradle, kind of string figuring of stories with each other, that that's what the Camille stories are about. Exactly, totally, exactly. Okay, now third question, no, four question. Okay, four question, acaba de llegar. Do you think that a nomadic ethic can be useful to think about the Anthropocene crisis? Well, the short answer is yes. Uh, the longer answer is uh, my love of Rosie Bredati and her yeah. feminist, <laughs> <laughs> her feminist <laughs> working <laughs> of, of a nomadic uh, oh, yeah ways of being and thinking and her way of using these ideas to explore uh, the, the, the uh, migratory earth, the questions of, of, um, of movement uh, that tie together the, the beings of the earth, the peoples and the lands of the earth. 
and then the um, the uh, opposition to a kind of fixity, to the kind of substantialism and human exceptionalism. Uh, I think of Rosé Bredati as, as my friend for life, as both a thinker and a human being, and everything she says I like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was Tanya's name, my friend in Bogota, Tanya Perez Bustos. I didn't say her name correctly. Uh, and she's the one who teaches me overwhelmingly about thinking in, uh, in fiber practice. She and Lucy Suchman, too, uh, and in science studies. Uh, these, you know, Rosie is in science studies, too. These are networks. Yes, this is important to our thinking in this time of the Anthropocene, this time of the ways situated human beings endanger life worlds of the earth, uh, called out the Anthropocene. Not mankind as such, <laughs> but situated human beings. Yeah, not uh, about this, <laughs> this man stuff. Okay. Not <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so here we go with a question from Jara Rocha. Hello, Jara. <laughs> And so she says, I would like to ask something in relation to hyperbolic spaces, as in the mirror and a half society of the so-called new normal, which in the of Euclidean surfaces is resurfacing with invention. What implications would it have to claim for non-Euclidean surfaces for this big fragment of a much more complex society than the tool by the one five mil tail? I don't think I know the 1.5 meter tail, um, and I should. So maybe she can fill me in a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. But the hyperbolic surfaces in the crochet coral reef, which is my way of learning about hyperbolic surfaces, and the um, which is precisely mathematical. Thank you. Uh, and the uh, both Christine and Margaret Vertheim. Margaret Vertheim is a mathematician. Uh, and has uh, Christine Vertheim is a is a person in literature and an artist, and they they're twins. They're from Brisbane. They've worked together for years. The Crochet Coral Reef is a project of now many years in many countries and many languages and many communities of practice that actually craft hyperbolic surfaces uh, as a practice of bringing into consciousness. Um, uh, responsibility for endangered coral reefs and their human and non-human peoples of the coral reefs. But the world is a hyperbolic, the world is hyperbolic, not e Euclidean. Or the world is probably more than hyperbolic. Uh, hyperbolic uh, surfaces and hyperbolic spaces and this kind of, uh, of uh, looping out uh, is, is only one mathematical practices among many. And mathematical practices are tools. They are signifying tools for exploring certain aspects of the world. They are thinking practices. Uh, and as thinking practices, they're highly material. These aren't, you can't substitute this for the world any more than you can substitute um, the, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the parabola or the hyper or the square or the circle or Euclid or Euclidean space. These are all tools for thinking and none of them is adequate. We, we make a terrible mistake when we think of any of these tools as somehow an adequate representation of the world, but they can help us explore. Um, they can open up uh, They can open up imagination and practice with each other for telling stories and living stories otherwise. And stories are not just fiction, they're the actual ways that we carry on with each other, I think. I think that this is last question, yeah? Okay, so this is Miguel Aparicio, he says that he's writing from the Brazilian Amazon, that we attack by the virus in a region without sanitary structures, and that Bolsonaro has to the environment said recently that we must take advantage to gain ground over the forest while we're absent-minded in COVID-19. Is it possible to make an alliance with the virus against fascism in this dramatic context? We, can, we cannot survive with fascism. Can we survive with infection? Yes, we can survive with infection, but we cannot survive fascism. I do think that the fascism, which is surging in Brazil and the United States in Hungary and many places, the fascism surging on the earth now 
uh, in powerful nation states um, endangers our presence and our futures, um, be partly because of the degree of damage already in place, that the resurgent fascism, which includes frank genocide, well, I think Bolsonaro is engaged in frank genocide, um, using the virus really as cover uh, for further, for really a, a, a kind of, for the push for a final destruction of the Brazilian Amazon, its peoples and its life ways, human and more than human. And in the United States, I think that the, um, uh, the cover of the virus, the cover of the pandemic, uh, ongoing deregulating environmental regulations, ongoing releasing of yet more fossil fuel extraction, mining, so forth. I do think that uh, fascist nationalist governments, which are uh, misogynist, racist, and frankly, uh, you know, frankly fascist, are using the pandemic um, for to further their larger and pre-existing ends. Can we live with infection? Well, of, of course we live, <laughs> you know, that um, infection is part of the biological world, including infection that kills differentially. And, uh, and I think that uh, the strengthening of public health apparatuses so as to protect human beings and the more than human world too, the kind of public health apparatuses that block infections into vulnerable uh, animal and plant populations, for example, the contemporary landscape, globalized landscape industry is a pandemic friendly industry for destroying um, plants and animals in all sorts of places in the world. It's, a, it's, an, it's an instrument of, um, uh, of destruction, the, the contemporary landscape industry that works through infection. So the, the need for, if you will, a kind of public health apparatus uh, around landscape design uh, a, a public health apparatus around what constitutes really protecting the peoples in places of work, in places of care for the elderly, in hospitals, in neighborhoods. Yeah, we can live with infection, which is not the same thing as doing nothing about infection and just embracing the virus. Nonsense. The virus is a killer. <laughs> Um, but uh, a kind of, of re-nurturing of biological complexity and habitats, agricultural habitats, forest habitats. These, these viruses, uh, more and more pandemics emerge uh, and do mass killing, both of humans and more than humans, uh, because of the ongoing destructive practices of uh, hyperbolic, you know, <laughs> hyperbolic global capitalism, which is really hyperbolic. <laughs> really hyperbolic, totally. The master of hyperbolic. It's not Euclidean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, I would like to go on. Yeah, but no, they say that uh, we, they have more questions, but it is time to finish. So uh, I would like to thank you, Donna, for this amazing conversation. It was really like, generally inspiring again, I say it. And um, I would like also to thank you especially to Radical May, you know, people who are organizing this this event, and also Consoni, the publisher, feminist publisher, good in Spanish. And I, I like to thank them uh, because of, they, they keep on working, you know, they keep on working under these very difficult circumstances and not for the sake of productivity. But uh, just because uh, they, they want to keep on the story going, you know, and I really appreciate this. And also, of course, thank you, the readers, because without readers, <laughs> there are no books. <laughs> you know, and of course, all the 500 people they say that have been following us in this conversation. And just remember, everybody, that uh, people from uh, Colonialismo del Sur, from Argentina, they're going to translate the conversation. And with the subtitles, so in a few days, maybe 15 days maximum, uh, it will be uploaded with subtitles. And um, I think that's all. Just uh, a final to finish is we are going to finish uh, the conversation with a very short piece of a wonderful and beautiful Maria Arnaz, who is an artist and singer, and who has uh, inspired herself in your book to. Uh, make a, a short piece and I'm going to finish the conversation with one of her songs. Okay. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. And Barcelona. It's good to be in Barcelona again. <laughs> oh. Oh. I hope so. <laughs>
Okay, so bye everybody and thank you. <laughs> Remember to buy the book. <laughs> your favorite, yeah, your favorite <laughs> library. <laughs> yeah, or you have also the ebook and support small libraries and small publishers because it's important. It's important. Okay. <laughs> okay, so thank you and goodbye to everybody. Yeah.